The following podcast may contain adult language and conversations revolving around situations not suitable for immature audiences. Spoilers and general political incorrectness can often be expected, so listener discretion is advised. They must be destroyed on sight! Okay, we're back, and we are now at episode 68 of They Must Be Destroyed on Sight, a movie podcast. I'm your host, Lee Muscuzzi Russell, and I'm joined by my co-host, I cannot pronounce the safe word, Daniel Harper. That does describe uh, pretty much the way that I handle safe words, because the point of a safe word is really to make sure that no one can ever actually use it. So uh, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 the way I, that's the way I play the game. So yes, thanks. Nice to be here. 68, have we been doing this this long? We have. Oh, God. Yeah. I think I think this podcast is about I think we're going on for three years. Is it that that long? Wow. Two or, two or three years now. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. I mean two years, two years makes sense. Definitely. Maybe it's maybe it's two years. Maybe it's two years. I'll have to go back and check. But um it's awesome. Yeah. We do have two comments to get to here, so we'll get them right out of the way very quickly. Uh Mike Murphy from the Badass Boobs and Body Counts podcast. In regards to our previous episode, he says Bikini Drive In is a classic for several reasons. Great comedy between Spellows and Hagen, Michelle Bauer's boobs, along with the other numerous boobs on screen. Yes, I agree. And the cast is full of great B-movie names. Now, if you're a casual movie fan, the cast means nothing to you. But if you've been watching B-movies forever, this is really worth seeing just for the cast. For your information, how dare you call Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers a bad film? It's fantastic, and it's the fourth greatest B-movie ever made, according to Maxim Magazine. So, yeah. Consider the source, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if Maxim says it, it must be true. Yeah. Goddamn Maxim Magazine. I remember flipping does through Does Maxim a... still exist? I don't think it does in the U.S. anymore. I think it yeah. might still be in Europe. I think it's sort of going the way of, like, the Page 3 girl and uh, the yeah. Sun newspaper or whatever. Well, I mean, all those magazines just kind of like, you know, like Maxim and Loaded and, you know, all that sort of thing. Like, it's it's kind of like, it's not porn. You know, there's no, like, brain behind it either. So it's basically like, you know, it, it's 15-year-old it's, boys need to jerk off. They have better ways to do that than to, like, try to buy a paper magazine. So I believe there's still a website. But, yeah. But, like, well, there's actually a printed magazine. I, I don't know. That, and, and the European ones at least have the sense to have naked women in them instead of just clothed women, scantily right. clothed women. Um, and it's it's as inane as fucking BuzzFeed anyway. It's BuzzFeed in printed form, essentially. So it's like, <laughs> right. fuck. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, I agree. And I think, I think we sort of uh, came to that conclusion, Mike, when we were reviewing there uh, last week that uh, with Daniel not being as familiar with a lot of the people in it, it wasn't as interesting to him as it was to me. And uh, I, of course, like you, totally overrate it because of our love for uh, all the uh, cornucopia of B-movie stars that have that uh, sort of appear in it, uh, even though the film on its own, just taken, just taken on its own merits, plot wise, is kind of garbage. I, I say bad as well in quotation marks, like you had it in in your uh, comment there, Mike, for Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers. Of course, I, I enjoy it quite a bit. So, uh, and we have one more comment from someone called CB Fall, not on the YouTube video, but on like the Google Plus half of where my YouTube videos go. So I actually, wow, I just, I just fell on this by chance. I didn't get a notification for it or anything. This guy's, I've noticed this guy's actually commented on a couple of our YouTube videos and all of his comments are pretty much the same. They, I don't know if the person's trolling us or if English is their second language or, you know, whatever. But uh, here's his comment. Both movies are a total drag to watch. Great podcast. So I I don't know. Is is that a backhanded comment? Is that, uh, I, I don't know. But I appreciate the comment either way. <laughs> anyone, anyone who says anything nice about me gets two thumbs up. Like, congratulations. Yes, I agree. Total drag, man. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. Thanks for listening. Yes, thanks very much for listening uh, and keep commenting. Uh, and, of course, if you guys want to leave comments, the best place to go is our Facebook group. They must be destroyed on site on Facebook. There you can criticize us, praise us give 
review uh, suggestions for future episodes, or not even necessarily movie review suggestions, just like suggestions of like, do you want to see some sort of weird themed episode, movie related that you want us to do? Like, you guys should talk about your favorite nerd characters in movies, or some weird shit like that. I mean, we're we're open for anything. If if it looks like a good idea, we'll do it. So uh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I guess we can move on now to what we've watched uh, as of late, and I know you have a couple things, dear Dan- Daniel. So I'll uh, let you go first. Absolutely. Uh, I saw two films this week, both of which were actually made in the 21st century, which <laughs> is uh, kind of uh, astonishing. If I mean, like, come on, how, how can I see anything that's made like in the last like 20 years? Uh, I did get to see Green Room. Um, mm-hmm. I actually watched Green Room after immediately after we recorded last week. I wasn't quite tired yet, so I said, "Oh yeah, I'll just go. I'll watch like the first half of Green Room, and then I'll watch the other half like tomorrow or something." And I sat down and stayed up till three in the morning watching the entire film. This is a phenomenal film. Not as good as Blue Ruin. Like I, mm-hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll say that it's a lot more conventional than Blue Ruin. I really enjoyed this. Um, I, I largely agree with you know kind of what you had to say earlier. I can see this being a uh, full on review we do, so I'm not really going to say much more about it. But um, yeah, this is absolutely worth seeing. Um, this filmmaker is one I'm going to be following from here forward. Yeah, like this, yeah. this is some really good stuff. And I'm hoping uh, that we get uh, James Murphy on for that, too. Maybe we can do the Skull and Green Room for an episode. I think that would be a uh, an interesting little twosome there. That works for me. I, I'm, and we can gang up on James Murphy and tell him how wrong he is about the ending of that film. I kind of I, I get where he's coming from talking about the ending, but I don't want to uh, I, I don't want to get too into it without uh, because there's no way to really do it without talking about spoilers and you know yeah, yeah. people should see the film first. So and uh, yeah. of course we're just kidding, James. Don't be scared off. We're not combative on this. Uh, yeah, no. So. James knows that I don't. I don't think James is thinking. Uh, I, James James is an angry Irish anarchist. I don't think he has anything to be scared of. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the other movie I saw this week was actually, I went to the theater and I saw the new uh, Ghostbusters film. Oh, yeah? Yeah. The most surprising thing about it was really, like, halfway through the film, like, the, the guy just came and, like, cut my balls off. Like, it was just <laughs> misandry all the way through. Um, actually, this was a uh, perfectly fine little, um, you know, sci-fi action comedy. It is the best thing with the word Ghostbusters on it that isn't the original Ghostbusters. You know, you think about all the sequels and all the terrible... Well, Ghostbusters um, 2 is pretty bad. <laughs> Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters 2 is... I mean, I kind of grew up with that, so I kind of, you know, forgive it a bit. But, like, it's it's not very good. And yeah. then you get the real Ghostbusters, and you get the anime series in the 90s. Uh... And the There's a ton of terrible stuff with the word Ghostbusters on it. This is actually really good. It's a lot of fun. Um, there's some really interesting kind of character stuff to it. It lives up to the original to a large degree. It's making some money right now. I liked it a lot. It was a lot of fun. I recommend people go see it. Um, I'll have to uh, watch it because um, I personally don't give a fuck about the uh, controversy and all that shit that surrounds it. But now there's two friends of mine that have given it fairly positive reviews. You and actually Mike Murphy from uh, Badass Booze and Body Counts rated it fairly highly on his uh, letterbox as well. So I'll give it a shot. And I'll uh, get back to you guys on uh, what I thought of it. So yeah, I mean it's 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 just I mean you know ultimately like it doesn't hold up to the like political side that like I mean and really the only reason that there was this deeply like political argument I mean, the controversy is totally based on like entitled dude bros who like grew up with the original and don't like the fact that there's vagina in their favorite movie now. Which is, you know, like, come on, dude. Like, nobody's going to come and, like, steal your, like, old VHS copy of Ghostbusters, I promise. Like, yeah, it's well, still going to be there. That, that, um, is, that is, like, the that is the main really silly point on that side of the argument is that, you know, as if this movie is going to somehow erase the original in some, in some weird way and, you know, take it away from every, as if, you know, uh, a bunch of women are going to come out and start burning all of your DVDs and VHSs of Ghostbusters. And this is the only Ghostbusters you can watch now or Ghostbusters right. too, maybe, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It really does kind of live up to that kind of, you know, kind of big populist entertainment thing. You know, this isn't a very deep film. I mean, I think, you know, there is some, um, some interesting stuff going on. And actually I just recorded a bonus with Spaceman with Jessica from Web of Queer. We already talked uh, a lot about it. So hopefully that'll be up either right before, or right after this episode goes up. And I will uh, just kind of point people to that for 
more detailed thoughts. But um, yeah, if you get to see it, I'd absolutely I'd love to chat about it with you in some more detail. Um, right it's on. a fun film, and I'd recommend people go see it. I mean, it, it legitimately is. It was worth the 10 bucks. It was worth the, the movie ticket. It's, it's well, well, that's good to hear, because all the trailers were fucking garbage. <laughs> the first trailer was really, really bad. I think that they, they got better after that, but I also don't pay attention to the trailers. You know? Yeah, I... Comedy trailers are just comedy trailers just kind of suck, right? Like, uh, trailers in general lie to you anyway, because a lot of the times you get a lot of stuff that's not even ends up in the movie, right? And uh, I will say that the one thing that like absolutely uh, I think any right thinking person will love about this movie is Kate McKinnon as Holtzman, um, who is uh, <laughs> the sexiest thing I've seen in a movie this year, bar none. Oh, she's sort of the... Um, she's the engineer. The, the Egon kind of right. counterpart, yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I look forward to uh, watching it and uh, and giving my opinion on it when I do see it. It's on Put Locker right now, I do know, so I'm, I'm probably just going to grab it that way. So Yep, no, yeah. it makes sense. So the one thing I watched uh, is this film called Holidays from uh, 2016. Would not necessarily recommend it to anybody. It's not terrible, but it's a, it's a horror anthology film based around the holidays, of course. It's got eight stories in it. They're very loosely based around the holidays. Like, it's almost just kind of a sad pretense, and ha- half of them you can't even really call holidays in the first place. Like, Father's Day isn't really a fucking holiday. But <laughs> Do they spell holidays with a D-A-Z-E, perhaps? No, they don't. Uh, but uh, you, you would kind of think they might, considering I think the only reason this movie got any attention is that Kevin Smith is one of the directors for one of the segments. Nice. So, All right, sure. So, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah. There's like two really good stories out of the eight that are in this. I think the movie suffers from the fact that there's just too many in it, and the writing's really bad on most of them. Usually with these anthology films, you want maybe five stories at the most. And you want some sort of wraparound, but this doesn't have anything like that. And then I'm I'm thinking back to uh, two recent movies in the last few years, the ABCs of Death, Part 1 and 2. Those both have 26 segments in them. The ratio of good to bad is hitting way higher than this, and they're just doing, like, really super short films right. in those. But they're getting them effectively put across, like, the ideas and the imagery and stuff. But this film, it just feels really weak. A lot of the writing in it... it it's just very obvious and not very good, but there are two really good segments in it, especially the one for Father's Day. Very, very creepy. I really enjoyed that one a lot. And there's this really interesting one for Easter that uh, sort of combines the uh, the Christian side of Easter with the Easter Bunny uh, in a very mm-hmm. interesting way that I quite enjoyed actually, and it was also quite creepy at the same time. So um, if if you can find it for free or you know on a video on demand service for really cheap or whatever check it out, but otherwise I wouldn't go out of my way to look for it. Especially Kevin Smith's fucking part in it is like the worst thing in the movie, honestly. I mean, I think he should just like quit making films. He should just stop at this point. Yeah, yeah. well, we could talk about Kevin Smith another time. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just really bad, but uh, yeah. his, his, his foray into horror is just, I don't know. <laughs> Stick with what you know. But yeah, that's it. And now I have a little little game I want to play. Sometimes we do Movie God on here once in a while, uh, which is a, is usually a lot of fun. I saw this game posed on a po- podcast I listen to on a regular basis called The Horror Movie Podcast. The idea is sort of like Desert Island kind of uh, questions, you know, like uh, if you could pick three things from this specific whatever, what would you pick? This is even more of a kind of harsh version of that. I will ask you, Daniel, you have a pick of one actor or actress. You can only watch their filmography for the rest of your life. Who would you pick? Oh. (laughs) So you got to think about that. You got to think about like... Right, like... do, Do you go with someone who... Has only made like two or three movies in their life, and but they're like your favorite movies, or do you right. go with someone who has crossed multiple genres? Yeah, so you have variety to pick from, even if yeah. like it's not, you know, like yeah, that was kind of the immediate thing. Like the immediate thought was you know, like someone like I don't know, like Samuel Jackson, who's just been everything, you know. Mm-hmm. God, <laughs> then the temptation is just to pick like a character actor, you know, yeah. <laughs> just to pick some, just just to like you know find somebody who's just been in you know. A thousand things. God. Um, I would probably pick somebody who is in a lot of stuff I really like, mm-hmm. who's always been good. So I always have good movies to watch, but who has kind of a, 
a longer career, somebody who isn't, um, you know, not so it's not just like two or three movies. Oh, God. I'm trying to find an actor? God, that's like, <laughs> and I knew he was going to throw this at me and it was going to, I was going to like stumble over it for a while. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it's tempting to just go with someone like Orson Welles, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like um, because there's a ton of that stuff that I've never seen. He was an amazing actor. He was in stuff for decades. And uh, I could spend the rest of my life just becoming acquainted with Orson Welles' filmography, you know, with everything. Yeah. And, and then you get all the stuff he directed because he appeared, I believe he appeared in everything he directed. Except for, Pretty is much, he in the yeah. trial? I don't think he's in the trial. But he appeared um, in the trial. Yeah, no, I don't think he's in the trial. No. Yeah. So I'd lose the trial, but I'd get all the rest of his stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's my answer. I'm going to go with Orson Welles. All right. Nice. I like that one. Unfortunately, there's definitely a cutoff there. There's a cutoff point where you can, you know, I think it was also kind of left open ended the way they posed it on Horror Movie Podcast, where you could pick someone who's potentially still going to make a lot of stuff too, as well. Right. right. So oh, yeah. you, you have that option as well. I um, mean, that means not watching anything after 1986. You know? Yeah. But yeah, yeah I, you know, I don't know. I kind of approached it as a like, oh, if if I'm in this situation, you know, <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess this is just the choice I get to make, you know. Yeah, and I, I was I was thinking on this as well, and uh, one of the picks actually made a lot of sense to me from horror movie podcast, which was uh, actually Harry Dean Stanton, who is oh, yeah. one of the most pro- prolific character actors there ever has been, honestly. Right, and he's right. still acting. I mean, he was in the Avengers movie recently, just in a bit part, but he was in it. And he's been just about in everything. Like, he's been in tons of movies I love, like Repo Man. He's even been in uh, at least one or two Sam Peckinpah films back in the day. Yeah, you're, you're right. Like, a character actor is really the way to go because if you're picking, like, a big star, that doesn't necessarily give you the best movies to pick from, even if they are, like, a big star because they're going to go for... Sometimes you're, you're going to get those, like, big popular movies that aren't necessarily great, you know? Right, right. I mean, you know, for me, it was like picking someone that I like really liked who I thought was interesting, who had a long career, who was interesting. And that was just kind of the the immediate thought was like Orson Welles was just sort of yeah. like, you know, so if you, if you gave me a few hours to think about it, I might find a more, uh, an, another choice. But that's certainly kind of my go to, you know, that that was my immediate answer. And I feel pretty comfortable with that answer, despite the fact that it means, you know, I don't get to see anything new ever again. Yeah. You know? um, but, you know, honestly, given the choice between watching, you know, kind of old masterpieces or continuing to watch new stuff, I'd probably rather watch old masterpieces at this point, you know? Although you might get a chance, uh, again, what the fuck is that? The Other Side of the Wind. Other side one of the wind. day that's going to get released. Yeah. One day. Because <laughs> there's <laughs> one more film I'll get to see one day. Assuming he appears in it. I don't know if he's even in it. Or you could switch to, like, John... Well, no, actually, no, that would be a bad... That would be a bad pick. John Houston. Well, actually, that wouldn't be a terrible pick. No, wouldn't be a terrible pick. No, he, he acted in some cool stuff. Yeah, Stridulum, you know, keep Stridulum yeah. at least. Yeah, yeah Stridulum in Chinatown, and uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what 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 a double bill, Stridulum in Chinatown. Put that. We should have done those two together. That would have been great. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, that's a fun game. I'll I'll yeah. we'll have to definitely uh, play that again sometime. Or. I, I, some, I, so, I, yeah, I can't wait till Paul comes back because I'm gonna ask him. And I, I honestly, I think I know who he's gonna pick too. I, I I'm, I'm pretty fucking hundred percent sure I know who he's gonna pick. But uh, we, we will save it yeah, when whenever you get your fucking ass back here, Paul. Get your sit, shit sorted out and uh, show up. Agreed. Clytus, I'm bored. What plaything can you offer me today? An obscure body in the SK system, Your Majesty. The inhabitants refer to it as the planet Earth. How peaceful it looks. Most effective, Your Majesty. Will you destroy this Earth? Destroy it utterly. Send Rick and Danny in wool rocket Ajax. So, just destroy it? That's what Ming said. Don't you ever listen? Well, there's no arguing with Ming. Hail, Hail Ming. Ming. Wait! You see those transmissions on the Visua screen? Crow? Nightmare on Elm Street? Chud too? Black Belt Jones? Nightbreed? 
What's a critter? Oh, I've seen those things. Flash? I guess we could wait a while before the destruction. Yeah, and watch some movies. And talk about them. The Hem Ming Power Hour. Disobedience to Ming. For now. You can find us at Legion Podcast. You can find us on Facebook. iTunes. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. At www. You know what? Just Google it for yourself. Just Google it, you bastages. Hail Ming. Breaking 2? Electric Boogaloo? Samurai Cop? Army of Darkness? Flash Dance? <laughs> 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 we might destroy the planet if it's flashed out. <laughs>But now we can move on to our movies for tonight. And the yep. first one we're going to be checking out is Gas Pump Girls from 1979. Pump Girls are having fun now that school is out and the whole town is there for the making. Hey, I hope I can remember everything I have to do. Don't worry, it's just four easy steps. Grab it, stick it in, squeeze it, and let it peter out. Gas Pump Girls, a motion picture delight when our girls change over a gas station and turn it into a fun station with sounds that will get you dancing while your tank is getting filled. Well, so treat like no one else in the world. Because anyway, what's going on here? Don't you need just a teeny bigger gas? I love it, dude. Hey, girls! Hey, gorgeous. Can I help you with anything? Yes. Could you hold this for me? Any way you do it, there's gonna be magic to it. I've always had so much trouble with these things. Just what is it you're selling here? Gas! You gonna pump gas in my little old pickup here? (laughs) Would you like regular? Directed by Joel Bender, written by David A. Davies, Joel Bender, and Isaac Blech. <laughs> I'm assuming I'm pronouncing that correctly. I don't know. Starring Kristen Baker as June. Linda Lawrence as Betty, 
Sandy Johnston is April. Ricky Marin is January. Leslie King is Jane. Demeter Phillips as Hank. Steve Bond as Butch. Ken Lerner as Pee Wee. Dave Shelley as Mr. Friendly. Hunts Hall as Uncle Joe. And Dennis Bowen as Roger. And actually, Dennis Bowen is uh, someone who's appeared on this podcast before. Uh, he was the redheaded guy in Van Nuys Boulevard. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I figured there was some cross pollination with some of these. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Daniel, if you want to move on to your uh, synopsis. In a ode to the power of working women everywhere, this is a film that dares to ask the question, what if recent high school graduates with nice racks had decided to put on skimpy clothes and pump gas during the tail end of the Carter administration? <laughs> the answer, it seems, is more akin to sexy hijinks than socioeconomics, which is a shame for the policy want moonks among us, but a boon for those looking for vintage female nudity and silliness. After Uncle Joe has a probably fake heart attack and can't run his struggling gas station anymore, the lovely June gets a few of her friends together to sell the sizzle instead of the steak and help the business regain financial stability. Since the silly girls don't know anything about cars, they are assisted in this by both a group of young 70s handsome men and the three members of The Vultures, a biker gang that seems, <laughs> a biker gang that seems ripped off of some more slightly more socially conscious happy days. <laughs> Foiling them in their attempts at economic relevance is Mr. Friendly, owner of the major market gas station across the street, who uses his deep pockets, business connections, and tithes to organize crime to challenge the gas pump girl's clear dominance of the TNA side of the oil industry. Will the girl reign supreme? Does a fake Arab sheik shit in the woods? <laughs> oh, man. And I, I like this film. I'll just say right off the bat. And this, is, of course, is the inspiration for Bikini Drive-In that we covered last week. I mean, it, it's so obvious. It's exactly the same plot almost, except it's set in a fucking gas station instead of a drive-in theater. <laughs> yeah, this is a vastly better film than Bikini Drive-In as far as uh, I'm And narrative-wise, it definitely is. And okay. I, I, honestly, I would argue TNA-wise, it also is as well. I, yeah. I quite enjoy looking at all the women in this one. Uh, the, the, this, this is a lot of fun. It doesn't have... There, there's no brain anywhere in this. Mm-mm. This is um, deeply silly. It's got some charming young ladies. It's got some fun, kind of goofy, handsome men. The vultures are something to... The, but on the they, screen, you know, there's a sort of surrealistic brilliance to the vultures. They're sort of a they're sort of a more competent version of Eric Von Zipper and his gang from the Beach Party movies. Right, right. Um, I mean, it really is like so. This film was made in '79, so you got to think like, okay, if you're a director in '79, so you say you're 40 years old in 1979, you know, you're kind of going out sort of like the teen stuff you grew up with. So you're talking about like West side story, essentially. And you're talking yeah. like, you know, all the, all the kind of, you know, um, so, so that's why they kind of look like fifties, uh, gang members with switchblades and like pompadours, but they're supposed to be these like seventies style tough guys. Well, um, I, uh, I had, they, they talk like, they talk like, uh, you know, knockoffs from welcome back Cotter. So, you know, they're yeah. Really well, well uh, I, I had the assumption that, Essentially, they were directly in a sort of ripoff of what was popular at the time, and Greece was popular at this time. I mean, they're very right. much like Travolta and his goons in Greece, which is which is again kind of that th- you know the seventies were kind of throwing back to the fifties, you know. Yeah, but it is kind of like you know, yeah, we're like we're like really cool teenagers in nineteen seventy nine, and we were like greaser haircuts, and it's like, and, uh, no. yeah, the, they got the look down, and then everyone's listening to horrible disco music. Right, right. Yeah, My so. God, the music is terrible. But but there's also kind of an American graffiti kind of thing going on here because you got that sort of semi narration going on throughout the film from the DJ. Mm-hmm. Playing yep. the songs, uh, a real DJ, by the way. I I didn't have his name written down here, but he he was an actual like uh, authentic DJ who had a pretty long career in that and acted as well in a couple of things. But um, yeah, yeah. yeah um, this this is this is a fun, silly little movie. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it is kind of like you know, I love the uh, bit at the beginning, the the thing I didn't talk about where at the high school graduation, yeah, yeah, the uh, the, the dude, uh, you know, like sets up the thing where when then she moves and then suddenly it's like, oh, my top comes off, and then you get like five high school girls at their high school graduation completely naked, not wearing tops under the robes. <laughs> no, no, just, just panties underneath the road. Yeah. Because, of course, you know, it's that kind of movie. And not only do you have that kind of uh, goofy little bit, the, the one girl kind of is kind of into it. She's like, yeah, yeah. I kind of like having the attention. Like, she kind of keeps you know, pushing her way back on stage, which I thought was like a real neat kind of like little mm-hmm. subversion of that trope. And then you get to, you know, that kind of sets up this, uh, the whole thing of the film, which is kind of about like, 
you can't just give your like body away. You've got to like sell your body. Yeah. <laughs> for, you've got to get money out of it, man, or else you're not doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. And so you do get that like slightly like no, it's not free love. You got to sell shit. It's it's gonna be the eighties. You know, we gotta we gotta really uh, make some money here. You know, the go go eighties. Like you got the sort of uh, vague characteristics of the different girls. Like so, you got the main girl, and it's like. Yeah, I'm actually kind of into showing my tits. Fine, that's cool. Then you have the one who's like, no, you got to make men beg for it and give you stuff right. before you put out. And then you have yeah. the one who's like the sort of more shy, kind of bookish one who's like, I wish guys would pay attention to me, but I'm just not hot at all, which is totally <laughs> wrong, by the way. <laughs> Plain Jane there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. you have the others who are just sort of like, eh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, literally at some point, at some point it's like there are two girls and then suddenly there are like six. And mm-hmm. it's just sort of, you know, yeah, I'll come and pump gas at this gas station and, and wear a skimpy outfit and, you know, like help you to overthrow this, you know, Mr. Friendly guy. Um, sure. I like the gags in it. They're so obvious, but they're fun. Did you, did you notice what? the name of the high school? I didn't notice that. What was it? It's Hometown High. Hometown High. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> Okay. Which tells yeah. you the universe this this film is set in, like right? Yeah, there. I mean, it's, it's 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 almost the kind of same universe as the cheerleaders, except for it's just not yeah. quite as smutty. That's that's about the yeah. only difference. I mean, this could be like the like the town one one town over. I mean, it's that kind of any town Midwestern Americana or like California Americana, you know? Well, well, it's, all the all the all the dialogue is like hardcore porn dialogue, but they don't right. they don't even engage really in even softcore or any sex scenes yeah. at all in the film. <laughs> <laughs> there's, just, there's just a little bit of there's just a little bit of I mean there's not I mean there's a there's a fair amount of nudity I mean but it's sort yeah of, I definitely could see this being like a really fun drive-in picture back in the day mm-hmm. like, like this this totally makes sense I watched this it was on Daily Motion so yeah, that's uh, I, I, I found that version and it's split into two pieces so yeah. um, it's actually I would so I kind of watched the first part and then kind of came back a couple hours later and watched the second part but it's a really easy watch it's 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 kind of goofy and fun um, there's uh, this sort of <laughs> there is a subplot involving some gangsters which kind of is is, is fun, you know, because uh, they kind of show up and they're just completely dumb, but not nearly yeah. as dumb as the ones in Bikini and Drive. <laughs> um, you know, these guys actually did like seem to like be able to actually have you know mental f- faculties above an autonomic nervous system. So you know, it's, it's a, you know um, they just kind of get fooled by you know tits walking by, like oh, I apparently need to go check out these tits. No, this isn't a trap at all. But you know, yeah, totally getting. Is. Get knocked out by star foam boards. Yep, yep. There's that. <laughs> um, I really like the uh, scheme that the gang gets to uh, take a gas from the uh, from the other yeah. side. I mean, you got to think of, like our our heroine here, um, June, is is actually like she she's really good at this. Like like she's she's kind of clever. She's kind of coming up with different ideas. And I mean, you know, it's all about like <laughs> basically we're going to distract men with our tits. Yeah. And then we're they're just we're just going to take what we want from them, and that's sort of what all her schemes sort of amount to. But um, you know, the the car scheme in particular, the gas scheme in particular, I thought was was fairly clever in terms of you know, and it kind of relies on the uh, way that the uh, gas pumps of the era you know worked in terms of they yeah. rolled uh, completely over. Not a deep film, but uh, definitely really enjoyable. And you get a you get a song, um, you know, June sings June sings. Yeah, a song, you get you know? a little little brief musical little, little musical moment, you know. I kind of I was just half expecting it to be like the Rainbow Connection right there because of the way it was shot and everything. Yeah. You notice the the uh, name of the gas company in the beginning? Well, I know the the evil one is Pyramid or whatever, no, no, right? No. Sure, right, right. But like on the gas pumps themselves, they're all selling Hevon gas. Oh, geez. all lowercase. God. So very clearly, they just took the C and like the R, and then just like crammed it together and then like changed the logo slightly. I mean they literally just like took spray paint over like big parts. Yeah. Of it, so. Great. Um, it's it's little they're not even like uppercase or anything. It's just completely chevron with like pieces taken out of it and moved around. So Hey, that's um, an artistic decision from the company. Yeah. Come on now. Hey, it's just it's just a thing, you know it's just a, they're, what they're doing is they're selling like off brand Chevron gas. They're, that's why the business is failing is because they're getting sued by like Chevron for copyright infringement. Hey that's but what you, those letters yeah. are. Yeah, but you know, here's here's what you do. You uh, according to this movie, all you got to do is mix regular with super duper, and it, you get more mileage out of your car. Yeah, 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 yeah no, that's the thing. Yeah, no, it's and, a special and, blend, man. Yeah, and the gas attendants at the uh, rival place who are, you know, they're supposed to be guys who actually know their job a little bit better than the bikini girls at the other place. They're like, that really works. Like, 
<laughs> they're they're yeah. the most easily fooled team of mechanics and. Uh... Well, and like we work literally like you know pissing distance from this other gas station, filled with beautiful women who I'm sure we've looked at. Mm-hmm. And yet, when a carload of beautiful young women wearing bikinis shows up, we have no knowledge of them. Like, who yeah, are these who are people? These? I don't know. These just random people who show up. Yeah, this is this is kind of goofy fun. There's not there's nothing really particularly deep in it. I mean, the one other thing I'd say is that it is like it does kind of capture that like late seventies like gas crisis thing. You know, mm-hmm. it does it does feel like it's sort of like made right in that particular moment. And um, it does seem to be, you know, kind of like the idea that they're running out of gas, even though in this movie it's it's mm-hmm. set up as a like this uh, kind of manipulation by, you know, Mister Friendly and his pals. Um, it does feel like it's like one of those things that a year or two earlier, or a year or two later, might yeah. just not have been in the film, you know. And then you get uh, Arab sheiks at the end, um, yep. and uh, actual um, people of Middle Eastern descent. Uh, who laugh at the fact that our heroes are are dressed in this ridiculous costume? You know, I, I kind of like that element, uh, so that was fun. And, yeah, and, um, and how about how about the guy who owns Pyramid Petroleum Company? By the way, uh, in one of the most, and and this was actually kind of carried over as well into uh, Bikini Drive In, but not quite to the same degree. But like in one of the most unrealistic plot twists of all time, the president of this oil company develops a conscience on the spot and does the right thing. Like it's <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I mean, anything that makes him money, right? I mean, I I do kind of see like he would just kind of look at it and go, "Yeah, girls in bikinis, like yeah. selling gas, yeah. like yeah, I can kind of, I can make money off this. Anything, anything that makes money, like these guys will will do. Mm-hmm. You know, they they don't they don't give a shit. So you know, that, that kind of struck me as as a, you know, I I admired that element and um. Bikini drive in, and I admired it again here. You know, just kind of like you know, it it is sort of, and now the movie's over because all our problems are solved because we sold out to the man. Yeah, <laughs> congratulations. You know, poor old Uncle Joe. Now he's now he's not. Uh, he doesn't own his own shop anymore. Yeah, there, he's there, working. He's working for somebody else. There, there is that like dark underbelly of it where where, and this was the kind of thing that was happening in the gas stations at the time. That was sort of the start of it where all these pop mom and pop owned gas stations were being taken over by companies. And sometimes they'd keep them on the run them. Sometimes they'd just run them out of the gas station, you know? <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, it, it's totally, I mean, that that's, that's what they do, you know? Okay. We mm-hmm. were homogenizing. We're doing all this. And you know, like if you're not going to play ball, we'll just take you over or we'll, you know, out compete you because we can sell cheaper than you because we have economy of scale. Yeah. Um, so this film so, isn't really about that, but I mean, it's oh. happening in the culture at that time, and it, I mean, it's got to be. I mean, also you've got kind of the, the big greedy, like the big like fancy gas station, and then you got like Uncle Joe's, yeah. and then the and, the way we combat that is tits. Yeah, you just put tits in front of people, and they'll come <laughs> shop here instead. Um, and, and I love the uh, the girl uh, inside, and she's uh, doing the announcements. Come on, you know you want to. Yeah. You know you want to pull in here. You know you want to fill it up. Yeah, come in a little closer. Don't don't stop now. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not suggestive at all. Uh, just just like no, the instructions on how to use the gas pump handle and everything. You know, <laughs> which is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I will say this: like when you think about it, Mister Friendly, he's going to win out in the end because he ends up working for the other gas station. But I mean, Uncle Joe, he's probably not going to last very long. So yeah, so Friendly's going to be promoted pretty soon, and he'll be running the gas station again, and he'll he'll have won. I like to think I like to think June will come back, and she'll uh, like she, she'll actually run the gas station because she was... she got a head on her shoulders. I I, I kind of you know she'll go to college, and Joe will last long enough to you know, kind of get through that and then he'll retire and she'll come and she'll keep the books. And, you know, in, in today, you know, she's like the retired uh, person who like ran like a um, chain of like a uh, franchise gas stations, yeah, you know? Yeah. So, so she had like 30 or 40, you know, locations and, you know, like had a, lived a good life. That's, that's my headcanon for these characters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there also, I, I would mention like when there's the scene at the uh, pyramid petroleum there, I, I just like the little moment where the uh, receptionist answers the phone and like the, the, the phone ring is this little Egyptian phone ring that's playing. I, I thought that was kind of <laughs> cute. Yep. Um, Kristen Baker, by the way, is really well known for, Friday the Thirteenth Part Two, and uh, yeah. unfortunately, not as a substantial role as what she had here. That one, she's just basically known for looking really good in short shorts, and that's it. Well, she does that here as well. Yeah, so, but know. but more. And uh, Sandy Johnson, 
who was a Playboy Playmate, uh, was Michael Myers' first victim in Halloween. Nice. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, his so, uh, older sister. And once again, like horror movie, titty movie uh, crossover. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. In a lot yeah, of these, I didn't look much into the cast. I was just kind of, you know, I did a glance through it. And, you know. A lot of these people actually had, you know, fairly good careers afterwards. One of the um, vultures is still working, right? Uh-huh. Like the the main guy who's, who's in the vultures. I didn't write down his name or anything, but like one yeah. of those guys is, is still working. And a lot of these uh, people were actually in Hots as well for the same year. Uh, sure. So another really well known uh, TNA comedy of the time. So. Um, there is some good crossover there. I like this for the charm of the actors as much as mm-hmm. anything. I mean, no, it's, it's fun. Main, your two main leans, June, and then the uh, uh, the super duper girl. Um, I didn't catch her name, but uh, uh, I think oh, that's um, I think that's Linda Lawrence as Betty. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure. Maybe yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Linda Lawrence. That was the actress's name. Yeah, I, I, I liked her a lot, even though she didn't really kind of go on to do anything mm-hmm. else. Um, you know. I, I, I just liked the, there's some really nice kind of little performance moments here. Uh, you get a uh, simulated blowjob scene, which is yeah, always... And the, ca- always and, in, and the, the guy keep, car. <laughs> the, key, the guy giving the car the full work over while he gets yeah. his blowjob, yeah. Yeah. Can't, can't, uh, can't complain about that, you know? Nope. Uh, fun times. There's no rape in this, which is nope. always a positive. You know, it's, it's just kind of goofy, funny stuff. Don't take it too seriously. If you're a fan of this kind of genre, this is probably one to, to check out. But um, well, yeah, this is kind of the this is kind of sort of the uh, real the real true prototype of the sort of um, sexy girls get together and save the business kind right, of movie. Yeah. Right. So I think um, I think honestly, the only one of the only earlier examples of this trope doesn't involve sexy girls at all. I think it was um, I think it was a Little Rascals movie or something like that that kind of did the same thing but uh, of course they weren't shaking their alfalfa wasn't in a bikini out there you know washing no, too down bad her. too yeah, bad it's too bad <laughs> no, i um the only other thing i would uh i would kind of point to and just kind of say you know what's um interesting here is just that i mean and this is something i i kind of i i almost started talking about last week when we we're talking about bikini drive-in but you know there is this kind of reality that these businesses, like the the kind of the the Hooters style restaurants and that sort of thing, where um, this kind of became a thing for a while, like in the eighties, mm-hmm. and super super tacky, like like this, oh, yeah. know, because ultimately what it was was a bunch of like middle aged white guys, um, you know, like caring about the dollar signs and then, like enforcing this like rigid code of like I don't know if you saw like the smoking gun put up like a um, like an employment uh, agreement like a, a non disclosure agreement sort of thing that Hooters waitresses have to sign oh, yeah. and, like, the, the rules of like how they have to like groom in an appropriate ways and you know, that sort of thing. And I mean, it's just this horrible regimen of like stuff you have to do for what's essentially a minimum wage job. You know, it's, it's, it's a really kind of, um, do they, environment. Do, do they even get tips at Hooters? Or are they allowed tips? They do get tips. They do get tips no. at Hooters. I mean, it's a tips job, but like I just kind of treat any one of those jobs as like it, it's it's not a particularly lucrative like place to work. No, because, no. you know, the people that that eat there are are uh, kind of you know they're there for the tits and they they they're just assholes. Like you know, it's, yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it enough times. You know, it's it's not. But uh, yeah, kind of what I'm where I was going was what's interesting here is that in Gas Pump Girls. The girls kind of do it for themselves. It comes across as a little bit more authentic, and it comes across as, yeah, we're kind of working within this kind of sexist world to to, to make some money, but we're doing it for our own reasons. We're not necessarily doing it like because like oh I need and I got to make rent this month, you know. So yeah, yeah. Um, I appreciated that kind of element of it. It was it was kind of fun on that level and um, slightly more justifiable on the you know uh, on the politics of it, but um, really fun, like really worth. Yeah, it is. The the free I paid for it I would do it again. Like, yeah. It would, it would <laughs> um, this is one I could kind of consider owning if there was like a decent DVD release. Is there a decent DVD release? Uh, uh, there there is a decent one from MGM, and uh, that's the best you can find now is the MGM from their limited edition collection. Uh, previous to this, there was one from Jeff Films, which was some un- unlicensed illegal rip from a laserdisc version of this. And of course, then there's like still, there's still probably some VHSs floating around for eight thousand dollars if you want to really look that hard for them. But yeah, um, right. but yeah, you you can, you can get a decent uh, MGM DVD of this. And honestly, those prices are probably pretty bad too. I didn't check, but they're probably pretty egregious on uh, eBay. So go to Amazon. The Amazon prices looked halfway decent. Still probably a little bit too much, but 
Um, if you really need it, uh, it is available. I think this one is actually streaming as well. Is it? Um, yeah, hold on, I'll look it up real quick. Because I was looking at how to get it because it wasn't as obvious as I thought it would be. But um, yeah, you can rent this for like three bucks or buy it for ten. Um, streaming on Amazon. Uh, the DVD is like twenty bucks. So yeah, no, that's fair. I, I I would honestly I would pay twenty bucks for a decent copy of this to put in my collection. Yeah, it looks like the older version DVD is like ten dollars. Yeah, and apparently that one doesn't look great. Either it's it's a laser disc rip, so it's probably not too bad, but you know, really decent, uh, really decent, worth checking out. If you yep. listen to this, you need to have an enjoyment for those kind of films. This is way better on a structural uh, level than uh, Bikini Drive-In, so I would I would recommend it was it was fun to watch, even though mm-hmm. I don't really have anything to say about it. It was a fun watch, yeah. Yeah, it's it's very light and fluffy, but goddamn, the girls do look good in it. We can now move on to Euro Trip from two thousand and four. For centuries, Europe has offered American tourists its culture, its culinary arts, and its mime. Can we please just get out of here? This guy is really creeping me out. Now, it's payback time. Two friends, two twins, eight countries. To Europe. You know, there are a lot of other empty compartments. What, what the hell are you doing? Oh, me scusi, me scusi. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh-oh. What? Big tunnel. Who's touching me? Scusi! Club Thundersex. There your every fantasy will be fulfilled. Yes, lady. On, on, Thundersex! So, are the girls c- coming back? Absinthe. It's illegal in the States because it makes you go crazy. They call it the Green Fairy. Jamie's hooking up with another girl. Oh, oh my God. God. Here's a fun fact. You made out with your sister, man. <laughs> that is just wrong. <laughs> Says here this town has a famous nude beach. Let the crazy European sex odyssey begin. Ladies, there's no nude girls here. It's just guys like us looking for nude girls. Cooper, the hat. The hat. The hat is on fire. We don't need no water. Let the mud. Oi, the bloody hell are you? We're from Ohio. Stop. Hammer time. These are magical. I am freaking out. I'm here. Let us make love for one whole month. Mi bello. Mi bello. Mm. Mi bello. Oh, mi scusi. No actual Europeans were harmed in the making of this film. Directed by Jeff Schaefer, Alec Berg, and David Mandel. Written by Alec Berg, David Mandel, and Jeff Schaefer. Starring Scott Mecklowitz as Scott Thomas, Jacob Pitts as Cooper Harris, Kristen Keurig as Fiona, Kathy Meals as Miss Thomas, Nail Ishkavov as Bert, uh, Michelle Trackenberg as Jenny, Travis Wester as Jamie, Jessica Bors as uh, Micah, Vinnie Jones as Mad Maynard, Fred Armiston as Creepy Italian Guy. Uh, <laughs> we will definitely talk about. <laughs> yes, and Lucy Lawless as Madame Vandersex. Uh, so, Daniel, please go on to your synopsis. Best friends Scotty and Cooper have just graduated high school, and just before the big party at a friend's house, Scotty's girlfriend Fiona just out and out dumps him, claiming, it's not me, it's you. <laughs> Scotty's snotty younger brother is heartily amused. Later at the party, it's revealed that Fiona has been regularly fucking a local rock star with a stunning resemblance to Matt Damon as he sings the incredibly catchy tune Sky doesn't know, but all the different ways he's fucked that quote-unquote remarkable sex puppet. (laughs) <laughs> which is to say Scotty's life was already going pretty badly and when his German pen pal who believes his name to Mike sends the sexually suggested message it's the last straw it's revealed the next morning by the snotty younger brother however that Scotty's German sucks big time and Mike is really the stunning blonde Nike and Scotty has just blown his chance with her all is not lost though as Cooper suggests the two of them take an emergency trip to Europe to track down the woman who may be the potential love of Scotty's life 
This trip to Europe, a Euro trip, if you will, takes the friends and fraternal twin siblings Jenny and Jamie, who are traveling to Europe on their own less romantically oriented itinerary, along a set of comic misadventures in several major cities of Europe, which all happen to look just suspiciously like areas of Prague. <laughs> Sexual shenanigans are aplenty, and the film eventually takes us all the way to the Vatican itself, where Scotty seems to have inadvertently been mistaken for the new Pope. It will assage your burning curiosity as to the dramatic ending of the film to let you know that, yes, Miki and Scotty do totally bone. Whether Jenny, portrayed by the gorgeous Michelle Trachtenberg, since I didn't tell you that earlier, manages to find her own sexual adventure or is even able to be recognized as a girl by our leading twosome, I will leave to you to find out for yourself. <laughs> this should be uh, retitled Rich American Kids Discover That Every Stereotype About Europe Is Pretty Much True. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or or uh, the colon, National Lampoon's European Vacation, the good version. That's, yeah. You know. I, I, I'm, I'm glad you uh, said that because I really highly enjoy this fucking film. I mean, it's, it's, big, it's big, dumb, and full of cum. And mm-hmm. it's, I mean, by that standard, it's it's not bad. It's super fun. Like it's it's just, I mean, just kind of like Gas Pump Girls, you know, which doesn't have a brain in his head. I mean, Gas Pump Girls does not have a brain in his head, mm-hmm. but it's like totally just kind of painless and inoffensive and just kind of fun and goofy. This there's a little bit more. I I would have I have some more issues with this, um, just because it is like stereotyping like entire areas of Europe based on like yeah, but this you know, is like the stupidest is... stereotype ever. But it's also kind of making fun of how stupid Americans are for believing this, right? You know, yeah. Um, there is a cleverness to this. Um, this and is, a this ton is... of rape, a ton of rape. Oh, um, yeah. Which you know we've been mostly avoiding rape this time, and then like the one from two thousand four is like wall to wall rape jokes. So you know. We're <laughs> But I mean, this this has like some of the funniest racism outside of like a Korean martial arts film that has Japanese people as the villains in it. Like, right, right. <laughs> but well, it, like, it's intentional like, here, though. Right, right. It, it's the sort of film where you like show up in England, you walk into the first pub, and then end up in like a really hardcore soccer football hooligan, club, football yeah. hooligan, you know, uh, club uh, who literally like a uh, Vinnie Jones is the uh, is the lead there. Yeah. Um, and then later on, we run into another guy from Snatch, which uh, I wish had made it into my summary, but I didn't uh, manage to. Mm-hmm. It. But, uh, you know, Vinnie Jones sitting there, he asked them to uh, <laughs> sing your Man You song, and um, they adapt remarkably to that. I, I do I do admire the, uh, yeah. the, the pluck, you know, shown by our heroes here. And then they just become fast friends. It's just yep. sort of, it's, it's that kind of movie. I mean, it's, it's, it really is just... Uh, you know, it's it's almost like I have a hard time even thinking people are going to get all that offended. Like, you know, I kind of imagine because I'm from Alabama, so I can kind of imagine like, oh, we showed up in Alabama, and then like we walked into a Clan meeting, and I'd be like, yeah, you know, you know, <laughs> it it's kind of Alabama is. It happens. Yeah. yeah, I get that. I get that. You know, the movie Hostel came out in 2005, and Hostel essentially lifts the plot of this film, except for what it does is when you get to the club Vandersex section, mm-hmm. uh. Instead of drugging the people and shipping them off to a place like um, Bratislava and having them murdered, mm-hmm. <laughs> they just do nasty things to uh, poor Cooper's butthole. But <laughs> right, right. which I mean, you know, the Club Vandersex section. Hey, like I totally forgot Lucy Lawless was in this. So mm-hmm. you know, go Lucy Lawless. Um, B. That's tame, man. Like Cooper, come on. Like you know, I don't understand he's eighteen, but like you know, come on. No, that but, was that was pretty tame. But of course, of course, of course, that's the joke that uh, all these Puritan Americans who have never had sex with more than one partner at a time and yeah, yeah. Oh, this this I mean, poor they, American. They are supposed to be eighteen, so we are we, we do have to kind of give them like like some credit yeah. for, for certain things. But um, there is this uh, sense that the film really just, particularly the Club Vandersex portion, because you, do you get the impression that this is like completely not a commercial venture, but like it's just it's just a like oh, uh, it's, it's totally for Lucy Lawless's pleasure that she's yeah, she's yeah, yeah. Not getting the enjoyment out of it. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> she's just, she's just got this like bevy of beauties who like show up and like seduce him, and then suddenly it's like. And now we're going to abuse the Americans. I kind of got the feeling you know, like she went to America and had a really bad time. So she like advertised things in ways that like Americans are going to be drawn in. And then so she goes, "Oh, he's an American." And then yeah. so everybody knows, "Oh, this is what's happening. We got it. We got it." Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Super rapey. 
uh, super uh, played for laughs, but also played as a very traumatic experience, right? You know, whereas mm. um, the, the rapists are not the heroes of this film. You know, no. they, you know, it's played for last, but at least they're not the heroes, which again, this is a morally relativist position I'm taking here because like, <laughs> but buddy. did you, uh, did you catch the names of the two big muscle dudes that she has? Hounds and Gruber, Hans Gruber. From oh, Die Hard. I did miss that. That's nice. <laughs> that's really nice. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's fun. Yeah. So, um, shall we go through the locations real quick? Just to, just to kind of, yeah, you know, cause, uh, I, I was kind of interested in like what your favorite segments, because this is very like segmented to the different locations they go to. So it, every, right. every, every little bit is like almost a self-contained little mini like sketch almost little mini right? movie. Yeah. 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 Sort of thing. I mean, I really love the Amsterdam sequence because that's, that's kind of the one where all four, you know, kind of characters each kind of have their own story because we, we've talked about the Van der Sick, the Club Van der Sick thing with yep. Cooper, but then Scotty and Jenny kind of go and they have the not pot pot brownies sort yeah. of thing. And but then, uh, you know, um, uh, what's his name? The uh, the nerdy kid, um, oh, uh, Jamie. Jamie uh, goes into the camera store and meets this uh, lovely young woman who was in Inglorious Bastards, by the way. Oh, was she? Yeah, um, do you remember the scene where um, the uh, sniper hero Nazi guy is, uh, is sitting in the cafe in France and he's uh, trying to seduce? Oh our, yeah, our, you know. And then uh, the uh, soldier comes up with his young uh, girlfriend and he wants you to write uh, a more Babette. Oh yeah, she's Babette. Ah, like, yeah, yeah. Now I gotta um, watch that again. <laughs> yeah, you gotta watch that again. Um, Man, she's. I mean, I. Sorry, I'm just gonna. She's fucking gorgeous. It's, yeah, it's, she is, and um, she really likes his camera. A she lot. really likes his camera. Like it's a th- like. I kind of get the impression that this is just sort of one of those. Like she, she's, she's not really into the camera as much as like she's just into nerdy guys, and she's like, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's go. Oh, well, you know. yeah, she's she's looking for pretense. Like, you want to go on smoke break? And it's like, okay. I don't smoke. I don't either. Yeah, I don't either. Okay, yeah, this sounds yeah. great. And then uh, uh, guy from Vader shows up Vader. And, uh, in in uh, for for thirty seconds and uh, gets to be the not at all European looking or sounding uh, yeah. burglar. So so basically, I think this guy is like an American who um, got abused at Club Vandersex. <laughs> and has uh, been taken up like thievery as a way of like getting enough money to get back home yeah. from the traumatic experience he had at the hands of uh, at the very um, talented and cruel hands of uh, Lucy Lawless's character. So um, you know everything's full circle in this film, you know, and really only because of the uh, the the wealthy white kid from Ohio privilege that our, our heroes do not end up in, in a similar circumstance. Yeah, so. one of my favorites, of course, is actually the soccer hooligan segment, just because yeah. I. Because uh, this one, this is one of the ones that really highlights uh, Cooper's sense of humor, which, uh, like he he makes some he makes the really good jokes. He's not like your standard uh, sex comedy where you have your your main guy is your hero, and sometimes he's just really unlikable. Like all the characters in this are likable. It doesn't have that annoying best friend. It has right. the best friend who's actually kind of funny and kind of enduring in his own way, and he makes well, all please. these. If we go back to like Zapped, right, where we had yeah. like Scott Bio, Scott Bayo, and then we had like Willie Ames as yeah. the like he's, the, he's the totally redheaded annoying. pervert, right? You know, yeah. it's totally that dynamic, but it's actually done with like charming and likable performers. Mm-hmm. So you know, um, by the way, the uh, the guy who plays Cooper, I just found this out as I was like literally looking at like stuff on on Wikipedia yeah. as right before we were uh, going to record this. Uh, he had a kind of recurring role on Justified, which is one of my favorite oh, really? shows. That, okay. um, yeah, he was one of the detectives uh, who worked with uh, Timothy Oliphant's character. Um, and I had no idea it was the same guy. He's really good in that show as well. Um, he's a kind of- well, yeah, I was, I, was, I was looking him up on IMDb there, and he looks totally different from how he looks in this film. Yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but he, but you can kind of uh, speak to the strength of his performance that he's like he he kind of plays this kind of like goofy. I mean, in another movie, it would be the stoner dude, right? Like, yeah, the, you know. I mean, yeah, but he's not. He's not kind of played to that. He's kind of played as the slightly kind of con artist teenage kid who's just yeah. uh, a little bit too clever for his own good sometimes. But you know, yeah, he he, he gets himself in cool situations, but all, all, usually they don't end too well for him. Like the hot tub yeah. scene, which was pretty fantastic. You know, oh, this is where I left my car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it's like, man, uh, so, so you kind of wonder if, if the girl in the hot tub with him was, you know, just a little unsure, but was starting to get into it, you know, secretly and like, 
Okay. Well, yeah. 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 Like it's it's funny because it's all about the way she plays it, right? Because mm-hmm. like at first she's like, "Oh, it's oh, there's something on me." Like she would never turn back if there was like this distinct lack of interest, right? Yeah. And then you know you kind of look at her and like the film does like it doesn't portray her as like stupid as yeah. much as it's just kind of she's incredulous. And yeah, I mean she... like clearly like clearly she's being manipulated by Cooper. But, like, she's kind of, like, getting the... You can read it as she's kind of putting on a show for him, right? Like, like she kind yeah. of understands what's happening well, and she's... Well, like, her, you know, her friends are gone, so she's like, yeah, you know, I could probably slum it with this guy right now. We, yeah, you know, yeah. We get, we get 10, 15 minutes together real quick, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, like, like maybe, maybe, he's, maybe he's packing, you know, who knows, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's totally us rescuing this film. Like, it's not... Oh, yeah. Is, you know, like, we're just pretending this film had that much thought in its head. Um, <laughs> you know, this is the, the whole reason that that scene exists is for the, like, and there's your R rating right there. Yeah, they even say it right in the fucking... They even say it right there, and there's your R rating. Yeah. <laughs> Jump in! I didn't. Live. This isn't where I parked my car. Yeah. And oh, when he gets to Club Vandersex, this is where I parked. This is my definitely car. where I parked my car. Right. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, Dave Mandel, one of the uh, writer directors of this, uh, mm-hmm. worked uh, with uh, Kevin Smith on, uh, like, as a producer on, like, the Clerks animated series and some other mm-hmm. stuff. So, um, uh, a lot of the people who worked on this, uh, the producers. They did Road Trip and Old School, which I think this is a better film than both of those, honestly. I agree. I agree. And they also worked on a lot of Sasha Baron Cohen stuff, too, like a couple yeah. of his later films. Uh, I don't yeah, think they did good. Borat, but they did The Dictator and uh, the one before that, the one where he's that uh, gay fashion Bruno. reporter or whatever. Bruno. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of, uh, I mean, there, there's this kind of long history with, I mean, you know, you, you do get like these guys who just kind of, go on and they kind of write and direct and, and kind of, you know, I mean, comedy is hard. Comedy is really hard to kind of, and so, you know, it is kind of nice to see people kind of continuing on in the business. Yeah, and, you know, if, I mean, if, Euro if, Trip is not a great film, but it's a really no. fun film, you know. And like, it's, it's, it's way it's way better than you expect. Like, I I, mean, I, when, I, I remember I, this is one of those that I kind of saw late night you know, Showtime or HBO or Cinemax or whatever. And, you know, like, it, as you would expect, I'm kind of flipping channels late night on Cinemax. And I remember I kind of saw the music scene at the beginning, you know. Yeah. And then, like, this guy that doesn't know scene. And I'm like, is that Matt Damon? Like, yeah. What the, what is, what is Matt Damon doing in this? Dude, like, yeah, what, why is he watching? here? You know, why is he here? And, I mean, you know, this is right in smack dab when he was, like, trying to establish himself in comedy. Because he had just, uh, like, I think the next year he did that Stuck on You movie with uh, Greg oh. Kinnear and the Farrelly Brothers. And, oh, like, he yeah, was, yeah. He was kind of actively working and trying to kind of build a, his comedy chops, you know. Um, he had also kind of worked with Kevin Smith a little bit. So, yeah. I mean, and so I totally get that, like, Dave Mandel just asked him, like, hey, will you come on yeah. and do this? Like, you come on and do this for a day and sing this song and be this, like, rocker guy and, like, feel up Christian Kirk. Would you Would you like to do that? And, uh, yeah, sure. I would be happy to yeah. uh, serve that role in this film. <laughs> it's, and this guy that's a no song is such a catchy tune. I don't know. I find it, I find it to be this, like, really uh like i actually listened to that song like after like when i had watched the movie and then i was like working on stuff and i'm like oh, i just put on sketches well, well it's, 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 a, it's a fun recurring joke too because it's so right. catchy and then you get the different ver like they're they're singing the song to themselves and then you hear the like club remix version when they go to right, the right, club right. and stuff and it's there's there's actually kind of a funny irony here that i'm sure was not lost on matt damon when he took this role one of his ex-girlfriends was actually stolen by uh lars Ehrlich. Uh, early oh, really? from Metallica, yeah. So he 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 actually experienced kind of that kind of situation. In maybe maybe that maybe that was the genesis. Of, maybe that was the real genesis of the film. You know? <laughs> I <laughs> want to make a film making fun of my personal pain right now. Or like Dave Mandel like wrote that in and went like, yeah, then we're gonna get Matt Damon to play it, and it's gonna yeah. be you know he's gonna say yes. <laughs> and that's how the film gets funded. I would totally believe that that would be a thing. Scotty doesn't know that Fiona and me do it in my van every Sunday. She tells him she's in church, but she doesn't go. Still, she's on her knees, and Scotty doesn't know. Oh, Scotty doesn't know. So don't tell Scotty. Scotty doesn't know. Scotty doesn't know. Fiona says she's out shopping. But she's on her me and I'm not stopping Cause Scotty doesn't know, Scotty doesn't know, Scotty doesn't know, Scotty doesn't know So don't tell Scotty, Scotty doesn't know I can't believe he's so 
So so they go to they get they end up in England then they go to France mm-hmm. they get the uh, they're also the Louvre and I will say like this is and and I referenced it before mm-hmm. um, this film was shot in Prague I went to Prague six years ago this film so looks like Prague like it, it really yeah. is um, but the uh, spot where they um, where the twins meet up with uh, Scotty and Cooper. I have stood in that spot. Like I know mm-hmm. exactly where that is. That's right in front of the Charles University in Prague. And it's a uh like that square, like the where they say the Louvre is, that's the National yeah. Museum, the Prague National Museum. It's only right around that corner. And I mean like big chunks of this film, like when they're in Amsterdam, they're yeah. actually like two blocks away <laughs> in the <this laughs> spot that I also know. Um, so, so it was, it was uh, kind of like, I had seen this film and then I went to Prague and I didn't realize, like, I didn't think about it because, um, the thing with Prague is the architecture is different enough around different parts of the city that if yeah. you're shooting a film that's set in Europe, you can actually basically shoot one thing and pretend it's France and then go around the corner and pretend you're in Germany all of a sudden. Oh. And it's a, it's a very common thing. And you see a lot of stuff that's kind of shot there. The, uh, the Czech film industry kind of takes advantage of this, but yeah, no, I've literally stood right there in, um, you know, uh, Jan Pollock square, which is where that is shot. And it was a very like surreal moment. Like when I rewatched this after having been there and I went, what the fuck this is <laughs> what, what it's a it was it so i just wanted to bring that up that it did i did this film does kind of have like a little bit of a like uh just a personal enjoyment for me just because it is like oh i recognize some of these locations hey, that's really cool because um when, when you think about it and this was a usa uh, czech republic co-production mm-hmm. um when, when you think about it the czech republic is essentially the european canada as far as the uh, american film industry goes because it's it, you know it's the, it's the good cheap place that you can get a lot of actors for a, a good price and you get good locations so yeah you you recognize that stuff like i recognize uh even though i haven't been in like a lot of major canadian cities i still know them fairly well enough where right, right. you know I, I watch i watch canadian tax shelter films that are supposed to be set in america and it's like that ain't new york that's montreal right there <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's total, totally that way um so they go to france and then they they end up at the louvre and then you get the uh, kind of a uh, faux like martial arts movie fight between the yeah. uh, living statue and scotty i used to think that was like the dumbest little sequence ever but I kind of enjoyed it this time. I kind it's of fun. get. I kind it's of so get. You know, it's it's so it's so just obviously okay. Let's take a little three minute section of this film and just kind of goof around with like 
this idea. I love the the, the Buddhist monk or whatever. He, just, mm. he sees the fight starting, and all of a sudden he's like, oh, shit, it's a martial arts movie. Got to get that fucking music going. <laughs> right. <laughs> Michelle Trachtenberg is in this. Uh, and she is so fucking gorgeous, and I'm so glad she, she was 18. She was, she was, she was 19. When yeah, they, you know, they so, this, so. so I don't I don't feel bad about drooling over her. <laughs> but like we're old men. Like we are old men. I'm 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 just kinda like, oh my god, this girl is looking at this girl then, I mean you know, she's she's like thirty now. But like yeah. looking at it then, like this girl is almost half my age. This is this is not this hey. is not a healthy place for me to be. You know? Hey Daniel, the way I the way I look at it is I'm just a couple million dollars away from it being respectable all of a sudden. So Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. So you know, I once that. I get those I get millions. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she is so not just gorgeous, but so like funny and fetching in this film. Oh, she's really good in it too. Like just a really good actress. I mean, she's a really great actress in general. Yeah. But like you see her in this, and she sells this kind of like simultaneous like naivete and uh, kind of sultry like knowing sultriness like really well. I really love the um, you know the kind of towards the end when she starts being like, yeah, I was really hoping to have this sexual adventure, mm-hmm. and it had been not such an idiot. We could have done it while you were here, Cooper. You know. Yeah, well, she she kind of sorry gave away the uh, ending there. I apologize. Yeah, well, she she sort of comes into the realization that she's like a lot more like Cooper than she realized, and that's kind of the reason mm-hmm. they get along so well. Is like almost like guy friends, you know, throughout yeah, most yeah. of the movie. And it's not until Cooper sees her bend over that he suddenly becomes sexually attracted to her. And it, it's almost like that cliche of take the glasses off, and all of a sudden the nerd is really hot. Right, right, it's right, yeah. the same thing, but she, you know, she just she bends over, so it takes off her glasses, and you know, both are pretty effective. She could, yeah. Know. I mean, you know, you look at it, you're like, holy fuck, like, yeah. yeah no, it's it's definitely a, a a moment in the film, and and a moment in cinema history that will mm-hmm. go down in history, really. Yeah, <laughs> you can't blame him. Is all I'm saying. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's funny because I honestly like when I first watched this movie, first time I watched this movie years ago. I actually kind of thought early on the way they were playing it that Jenny was going to hook up with the main dude instead. Like it, it felt like because you, you sort of got their friendship early on that yeah they're really fast friends they're really good friends and I was almost thinking okay it's it's going to work out this way it's going to work out very very traditionally where she ends up being the love interest of Scott at the end and Cooper's going to end up with like some like really slutty European chick who's like into doing all kinds of weird nasty stuff to him like if, if he, he ends up with Lucy Lawless in the end yeah, right? <laughs> yeah something like that it, it, that that would have been the traditional route to go but they actually right, right. change it around a bit and I like that. No, I always totally bought that. Like, I never had any doubt that like Mike and Scott were going to end up together. Like, like I, if there is kind of one criticism, is that the film definitely leans too hard on the like this is like a relationship that's going to last. Sort of well, like there, it, like it there thinks is, we care about this relationship, right? You know, well, there yeah, and there is an alternate ending. Like, there's there's 20 minutes of footage that they cut out of this. If you go if if you looked at the unrated DVD of this. There, there's all the extras. There's 20 minutes of footage to cut out of this. There's an alternate ending where Scott comes up, and it's the more realistic ending, honestly, where Scott comes up to Mike and says, I love you. I want to be with you forever. And she's like, I'm not into that, but you want to still fuck in the confessional booth? All right, let's oh, do that. yeah. That's yes. the better ending. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I like that ending. Yeah. No, that's <laughs> great. You know, I was going to come visit you just because I thought we'd like to bone, but, you know, like... yeah. No, I, I like that ending, you know, and then it kind of moves on and, and kind of goes off to college and, you know has wealthy white guy sex. I get that. I get that. Okay, you know? okay. so let, let's let's move on to Fred Armisen here and <laughs> the creepy Italian yes. guy. Uh, so yeah, let, let's. Let's, let's just say right, right off the bat, I knew, I knew it. I knew from deep down in my heart that every European is a sexual predator. I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to put it out yeah. there. You, every, you guys... every, every person from Europe, including the, the ones that listen to this podcast. Are, you're, you're all sexual just, predators. You're all, all terrible people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, especially from Italy. That seems to be the the thing, you know. Fucking perverts, man. They're even worse than the Greeks, man. God. <laughs> so the Fred Armisen portion of this film is the most deeply uncomfortable part of this film. And probably the one big sequence that I think just doesn't work at all for me. Oh, uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm not a big fan. I mean, and I, I hate, I hate like saying, I'm not a big fan of Fred Armisen in general. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I've never really seen him in something where I thought like, oh yeah, look at how brilliant he is. I mean, like his episode of like Parks and Recreation is my like least favorite episode of Parks and Recreation, for instance. Not necessarily even because of him. It's just kind of a terrible episode. But I don't hate him. I mean, he's he's fine. Isn't he's he in? He's in Portlandia. Isn't that supposed sort of, to be good? It's. I mean, I've seen a bit of that. It's you know, it's fine. You know, it's it's not my kind of show. But like, yeah, he's, I mean, he's he's perfectly fine in that. I I you know, I'm not trying like damn him with like you know, i'm not saying oh he's a terrible actor i'm just saying like i'm not particularly on board with like fred armison's characters especially mm-hmm. his like kind of ethnically ambiguous pervert characters <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, you know it definitely kind of plays this for laughs it goes on a little bit too long the one thing i'll say about it is that it absolutely like says this is i mean this is how rapists actually do their thing right because mm-hmm. like he's basically using the like social convention he's using this thing of like oh i just say excuse me and you kind of will just kind of accept whatever i do is like normal behavior because you have no way of like combating that in like a socially acceptable way but he's absolutely kind of acting as a predator and he's absolutely mm. kind of portrayed as like not a cool guy for that so i do appreciate that element of it you know it's just really uncomfortable and i don't think it really belongs to the film um uh, i i feel totally different on this where this is actually pretty much the only Fred Armisen performance I've seen that I actually got a kick out of that I sort yeah. of chuckled at, and I think I think part of the reason for that is I've seen so many sort of like European like titty flicks and sex comedies and stuff like that where the main characters in films like that are not at all they're not even like one or two places removed from what he's doing here like they're very much played right. in that that way and yeah i mean in in reality he's a disgusting fucking rapist pervert right, right. who should be just beaten in the streets but here i didn't I, I guess I just just personally, and I totally respect you not liking it. I, I found it really hilarious because I, I knew it was what it was being played for. It was being broadly comic, and yeah, I didn't have. I, a I mean, I, see, I do I do see it as broadly comic. I just see it as like more just uncomfortable and like like kind of one note. I, I wish oh, I wish yeah. it hadn't gone on quite as long. I wish it was kind of a little bit more. I wish it did something a little bit different with it than what it does. I mean, I'm I'm yeah. fine with it kind of being in the in the film. Would you have yeah. felt better if Vinnie Jones had beat the fuck out of him? Yeah, that would have been nice. Yeah, that that would have been yeah. funny too. I would have liked that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, you get your hands off me, mate's balls. <laughs> I think Vinnie Jones should have just wandered through the film with these guys. You're right. He was You're he not. was the best. He was actually one of the best characters. Like, uh, I, he they needed more Vinnie Jones. This is probably one of his best roles, honestly. And it's so <laughs> need little. More Vinnie Jones need more Vinnie Jones is like almost just a legit like an always thing, like in yeah. every film, you know. <laughs> Hey, Pride and Prejudice. I would need more Vinnie Jones, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you twat, you sitting there in your fluffy dress. You treat <laughs> you you treat your man right. Finding Dory. Oh, it needed a little bit of Vinnie Jones. It really would have been better, you know. <laughs> you stupid fucking fish. I will always think of Vinnie Jones as Desert Eagle 5.0. That's yeah, just... bullet, bullet tooth Tony. Yeah, and of <laughs> course uh and I I I had his name written down, but I didn't even want to try to pronounce his fucking name. But he's Raid something or other. <laughs> he he's in the he's in the film as well as the uh, in, when they get to Bratislava, um, talking uh, about the um, and uh, that's that's actually my favorite. And it's so brief, but that's actually my favorite sort of comedic segment in the film is where they just meet up with him and they're in this like downtrodden Eastern European slum right. and. It's like, ah, oh, the Miami Vice uh, new hit show in America, my friends and stuff. Like, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, no, it's 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 pretty classic. I mean, it's kind of like that very, like, old joke, like, oh, we're 30 years behind things because we're in Eastern Europe and, like, yeah. who used to live under communism. Um, but it is, it is, he sells it really well, and it is kind of a really clever thing. <laughs> Where like a dollar eighty three buys them like buys all them the, everything. everything and they have they change ever left want. over. They have, they have like, left over. <laughs> they have enough change to like buy tickets and and yeah. This, awesome. this is a movie that says like everything you as a stupid American believe about Europe is actually true. Yeah, like, that is that is the reality. But yeah, what's after uh, Paris? They go to Amsterdam, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and then you get the the. The very nice. We've kind of talked about Amsterdam a bit, you know. Um, yeah. Then they go to the nude beach. Is that is that after that, or is that uh, nude? I think nude beach is way before that. Like that's their. 
I think that's like their first stop where it's just like it looks really boring. And then they're reading the guide. And it's like there's a famous nude beach, and they go there, and that's where you first see the real nudity in the film. And then that, and when you think about it, the male to female ratio nudity in this film very much more on the male side because you get yeah. a lot of penises and a lot you, of ass. You got, a, you, got you got a lot of shaft in that scene. Yeah. So you know, um, but yeah, no, that that that's a that's a. A fun little bit. Of course, you know, the way these films always do it is that male nudity is played for laughs, whereas female nudity, nudity is played for, uh, you know, titillation. Yeah. So, you know, um, uh, but yeah, no, it's it's portrayed, at least there's some gender parity here, you know, where you yeah. do get a, a nice uh, <laughs> nice set of um, schlongs out there who are all trying to rape Michelle Pratt- Trachtenberg the yeah. second they discover she's a girl. And of course, you also get basically the scene that's on the uh, front cover of the film, which is uh, Michelle Trachtenberg in a bikini. Yeah. Um, she, she's wearing these like, weird, frumpy clothes, and it's like, oh, nude beach? Okay, I'll take this shit off, and let's, let's right. get this going. And she's completely like, oh, yeah, totally. I'm going to do this, you know? Yep. Yeah. And then it's like, no! Um, <laughs> yeah, they there. They're trying to go to Berlin. They get in Bratislava, and then uh, we go to Germany, and then... Yeah, and yeah, uh, the little the little Hitler kid, by the way, the little uh, boy from Brazil kind of thing, nod there. Yeah. Uh, oh, and Bratislava, I forgot to mention, there's actually a Kurosawa reference in that. Oh, the, really? The, the dog with the human hand in his mouth? That's oh. Straight, that's straight out of Kurosawa. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. I didn't... Because I didn't, I didn't, he, uh... he uses that in, like, a couple of his films. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mo- most notably Yojimbo, where where, you know, where uh, Toshiro Mifune first walks into town, and the first thing he sees is a dog run past him with a human hand in its mouth. Wow. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen Yojimbo, and now i got to receive Yojimbo. So, yeah. your trip taught me I need to catch up on my Kurosawa. That's, that's, <laughs> kind of a, <laughs> that's pretty badass, actually. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. But yeah, they go, um, they go to Germany. They see the weird uh, German parent who's yelling at the maid, who's like way too old to be a maid at, at any <laughs> at that right, point. Right. And the little Nazi kid. And then they go. Jamie is a good friend and actually sells a super expensive character uh, camera, so they can actually fly to Rome and catch uh, Mika. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is a nice, a nice of him, you know. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, I, I do think that this Vatican sequence, again, it goes on too long. It, it mm-hmm. feels like it's a little... I mean, it, it's kind of playing... It's trying at this, like, kind of farce, which the film hasn't really done until now. Because yeah. it's doing the whole, like... And then he turns out to look like the Pope, and they think, yeah. you know, like... And it feels like... And this is the section that kind of feels like, okay, and this is the kind of a little bit more mainstream studio comedy, like the yeah. dumb studio comedy version. This is the stuff that feels like, oh yeah, this is what you know, National Lampoon's European Vacation was all about, you know. Whereas the earlier stuff, at least, feels like it's got a little bit more sophistication to it. Where you're not literally like setting people's hats on fire, <laughs> you know. Sort yeah, of thing. yeah, I, I totally agree. Like that whole sequence, like you, you could, you could see Sh- Chevy Chase doing the exact same thing, mm-hmm. like. Yeah. Um, to me, to me, it's kind of like I don't. I kind of frankly don't understand why it's in the film, except like it. It sells the. I mean, you kind of get the Fromer thing where where Jamie gets to kind of go off and you know kind of have that experience. But you could have just as easily been like, oh, Mika isn't here. She's here at this museum in Berlin, and we're going to go to this museum in Berlin, and then he's going to track her down. You know, you could have very easily just done that, and then not yeah. done the like kind of silly you know, Pope stuff, which yeah. kind of goes nowhere. Anyway, that that's kind of, I mean, you know, the, the my two big criticisms are basically, you know, the Fred Armisen bit goes on too long and the, like, stuff in Italy just doesn't make any sense. You know, for <laughs> being in the film. Like, the film should end in Berlin. You know, the whole, yeah, the it, whole it, structure it, of the film is we're trying to get to Berlin to see Mike. That's where the film should end. Just sort it, of like yeah, a, it, it, just, it just feels like an excuse of we haven't hit every major kind of piece of Europe to do right. our travel log with. So we, we got to get Rome in, we got to get mm-hmm. Vatican city in, you know, you know, so. right. which but is yeah. of course just shot in the Prague national museum. Yeah. Shot around the corner <laughs> from the, where they're, where they're pretending is the Louvre there that's shot around the corner from there. Oh man. No, those, those, those fucking liars. Those, those yeah. scumb- scumbags. Um, scumbag filmmakers yeah. lying to uh, us. I do. I do want to mention a little bit. Like, there's that little bit in the bar there where, uh, unfortunately, uh, Jamie and Jenny end up making out with each other. <laughs> right, right. By the way, what Michelle Tret- Trettenberg was wearing in that—that's a hell of a shirt. Or uh, <laughs> that's not a hell, quite. That's 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 a that's a dress. Yeah. That is... or, well, no, it, it was it was a shirt, and she was oh, wearing no, it's pants. A shirt. Right, it's a shirt. Yeah. 
But I will say that's it's not quite a shirt at the same time. It's, uh, it's very little. It, it's cl- it's club wear. It's it's very you know it's very very nice you know. Yeah, but uh, I, I did want to mention uh, absinthe. Another another sort of thing we're playing off of American ignorance of uh, right. certain things in Europe, where uh, you absinthe of course is a anise uh, flavored spirit. It's taking from mostly a botanicals from like herbs and uh, flowers, and one of the big components is wormwood which is slightly toxic. And, of course, there's always this sort of myth uh, about it, popularized the, in, like, the, late... The myth is that it's hallucinogenic. Yeah, no, so late like 19th... That it's like LSD, you know? Yeah, yeah, like, late 19th century, early 20th century, a lot of artists and uh, writers and stuff used it, like uh, Ernest Hemingway, Pablo Picasso, Vincent van Gogh, Oscar Wilde, Aleister Crowley, Edgar <laughs> Allan Poe, and even Lord Byron all used it. And so that sort of myth built up. Do you the know why th- that myth built up? Why? The way you traditionally serve absinthe, right? And the, mm-hmm. so this is where the uh, the Hoogly Boo- Booze Review section of this podcast <laughs> comes in. So we're going to talk about the history of absinthe. So the way you traditionally serve absinthe is you, you know, you pour it in a glass and then yeah. you put a spoon over the glass. You put the sh- sugar cubes over that. Yeah. And then like what we do is we pour water over that. It like dissolves the sugar cubes. And so back in the day, they weren't using water. They were using laudanum. Mm-hmm. Laudanum is liquid morphine. Nice. Okay, that's that's something I didn't know. That's and, why that's why people get fucked up on <laughs> on wormwood. It had nothing to do with the absinthe. It had nothing to do with the wormwood. It had everything to do with the fact that like you're consuming high levels of opium here. You know. <laughs> okay, so, well, that, that's that's very enlightening to me because uh, I was going to say the reason that a lot of people are hallucinating from it was the fact that. Uh, absinthe is a spirit that is distilled at a very high ABV, like way higher than even most whiskeys. Right, yeah. it, it, it generally ranges from like forty-seven or forty-five to like seventy-four percent, or something like that, or even higher yeah. in some cases. Uh, I worked in liquor store for five years. I sold a bunch of um, absinthe to people who thought it was going to get them like high. But the restrictions have definitely uh, lessened. Like it, it was restricted yeah. in a lot of places for quite a long time. It was restricted for forever. And in fact, like even when I went to Prague, where you know there were like absinthe bars in Prague, and like reasonable people who should have known better were saying like, "Yeah, we got to go get fucked up on absinthe." And it's like you realize like this isn't going to do anything. Yeah. Um, the other thing is when you're talking about like 19th century distilling methods, um, especially for something that's going to be a little bit higher alcohol by volume, you're going to be pulling off some of these, uh, some of these methanol, some of these, some of these other yeah. alcohols that aren't ethanol, and uh, those could have kind of messed up effects on you sometimes. So you get some yeah. isopropanol, you get some acetaldehyde, you know, and, and that sort of stuff, which isn't an alcohol, but still. Um, so some of the um, damaging effects, you know, some of it did come from the morphine, but some of it just came from like, you know, just bad alcohol, you know, bad grain alcohol essentially as yeah. part of the distilling process. So, but, but the, you know, it's really, the, in this film, it's really only so they can do the, like, green fairy gag. Yeah, um, uh, that's like, really fucked up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but uh, if you do want to see, like, absinthe, the actual process, uh, watch the movie From Hell with Johnny Depp, where he's uh, he's both an opium smoker and an absinthe drinker at the same time, so he sort of combines the two and it, it increases his psychic hallucinations in that film or whatever. But right. uh, yeah, so I, th- I thought that was interesting. I, I thought that was a cute little, uh, or the little show Carnival. Carnival. Carnival uses oh, it. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Fuck. That's uh, Patrick uh, Buckhow. Patrick Buckhow uses uh, like absinthe and. God oh, damn, that's been a long while since I've seen that. Fucking show. I can't believe I just pulled that shit out of my head. Yeah, I, you know, that's like, a deep I, cut like, right there. That was a, that was a deep. Like, not only did I pull Carnival, but I pulled Patrick Bacow out. Yeah. Like, right there, like <laughs> without even prompting. I like whenever I do something clever on this podcast to absolutely call myself out for like how brilliant I just was, so that the audience knows, so that they recognize how how clever that just was. You know. Everyone better fucking recognize, yeah. Yeah, and um, we only do it when we're talking about like shitty, not <laughs> shitty, but when we're talking about movies that like no one has ever referenced Patrick Bacow in connection with Euro Trip yeah. and Gas Pump Girls before until today. This is yeah. the first time. This is the first so, time. Yeah. Mark it down. Get get on that Google. Reference yeah. that shit. On DMVDS Wiki. Make sure to include yeah. that. You know? Put so, yeah, whoever's doing that, because I'm I'm assuming someone's doing that now. Someone's doing the TMVDOS Wiki. So uh, yeah, yeah. the get access to it, access to it behind the paywall. So you know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you know, a lot of unfortunate people are going to be very unhappy. The budget for this twenty five million dollars, unfortunately, did not even make that back. Uh, it was only a twenty point seven million dollar return. 
Um, and I think part of the reason is that this was kind of the tail end of that sort of uh, sex comedy thing that American Pie kind of shut off. And yeah, well, it's kind of after Road Trip, and Road Trip mm-hmm. was kind of Road Trip was kind of a bigger hit. I mean, you know, because of the it, it, you know intense uh, and burning star power of of uh, Tom Green, Tom Green, amazing, of course. And DJ Squalls, you know, uh, DJ yeah, Qualls, DJ, DJ Jesus Qualls, Christ, yeah, who is uh, actually actually really really good in one episode of Breaking Bad. <laughs> he <laughs> appears in the pre credits yeah. episode. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I think uh, like uh, an under like he's fine in Road Trip. I you know Road Trip is perfectly fine. Road Trip's by far the better film. Like it's it's a lot more interesting. It's a lot yeah. more fun than Road Trip. I think. Although no Breck and Meyer, so you know what are you gonna do? Oh, right? fuck. What are you gonna do without Breck and Meyer in your film? But yeah, no, I I think this is one though that kind of has had legs on like DVD and you know kind of broadcast rights and that sort of thing. I, I mean, I think people kind of discovered it later. I mean, certainly I didn't like see this in theaters, mm-hmm. but you know. Uh, the issue you run into with these kind of films is, like, it's kind of pitched it. I mean, this is something I kind of talked about when we talked about the summer job, you know. Like, if you get characters in your film who are, like, 18, you're kind of pitching that the audience is more like 15. Yeah. You know? But it's an R-rated movie, so 15-year-olds can't get into it. So you then, you know, you kind of immediately, like, shrink your audience to some degree. And so your audience is then not so much, you know, it's only, like, 17, 18, 19, 20-year-olds, but then, like... You know, then you get to people who don't really want to watch a movie about high schoolers anymore, yeah. you know, sort of thing. So um, there is that kind of paradox of, like, trying to make these things for kind of a broad audience. And that's why we had so many of them, you know, so many of this kind of thing that really were like that PG-13 where they wouldn't do nudity. They wouldn't really do, like, explicit you know, sex or any yeah. kind of ideas. And it would just kind of be this um, really sanitized version because that's the version that like the 15 year olds could go see, you know? Yeah. So, and I think it's unfortunate though, cause I watched this earlier in the week and then I rewatched it today just to uh, refresh myself. And I laughed quite a bit both times. Like this is like yeah. a genuinely funny movie that I'm actually surprised I don't own. I actually have to get my ass out there and get a fucking dollar uh, bin fucking copy of this somewhere and, and get it in my shelf because this one I actually enjoy watching. Like there, there's all the fun nudity and all that stuff as well. That's highly enjoyable, but it's actually a really funny fucking comedy. I, I really enjoy it. Like the jokes really do amuse me quite a bit. I, I was laughing out loud the, today and t- today has been fucking deathly hot and yeah. a shitty fucking day and I have not been enjoying myself, but I was watching this and I was like, yeah, I was laughing. So, you can buy this on DVD at, in Amazon, mm-hmm. uh, used for sixty six cents plus shipping. Wow! Uh, yeah, and yeah. There, there's several DVD releases of this. Uh, oh, and there's a Euro Trip Road Trip, like a two oh, yeah. there double feature. You can buy that for a penny. Yeah. So um, this is totally gettable if you <laughs> own this DVD. <laughs> wow! And if and if you want, you can get like uh, the unrated. You can get the rated pen and scan version as well. That was released if you if yeah, you really want I'm to grab sure. that. I'm sure. Yeah, so yeah, no. Um, I, I will. I will uh, point out like my favorite deleted scene, possibly of all time for any movie ever. Mm-hmm. Um, that's sarcasm, by the way, for the audience that <laughs> like recognize that. Um, there is a deleted scene where um, Michelle Trachtenberg, before she pulls, uh, she they're on the roadside. They're trying to get the mm-hmm. guy who's going to eventually drive them to Bratislava because Scotty doesn't speak very good German. Yeah. How he managed to get Nike with knowing some little German, I don't quite know how that happened. Um, she just dick. That's all there is to it. She just, it's that she had this desire for American dick, you know. Yeah. It's, you know, um, but there's a scene where uh, she's uh, trying to entice the uh, the guys to uh, to pull over, and so at first she's like, "Oh, look at me, I'm a cute girl," and then, and then she's like showing her top, and then uh, they have this whole um, you know thing where like this is Europe, like they have they have orange juice ads with topless lesbians on yeah. television, like you know you can't uh, you can't do this in Europe, you've got to be more aggressive. Um, and then the uh, the other two are like holding Cooper back from like trying to go and like tackle her and see her tits. So you know, yeah, um, it's a it's a really like Michelle Trachtenberg sells it really really well. Um, and uh, that and, is on uh, YouTube. You can go watch it right now if you. And I, and then also there are uh, fan edits out there where people uh, put <laughs> fake breasts on the video for you to <laughs> for. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god! Really? Yes, there there really? are there are some people who have spent the time and it in. I've watched it and it actually looks good. Like someone took the time to actually 
put fake breasts on the video of that cut scene, and they actually made it look halfway decent, where you actually, if you were, you know, a total moron, you actually would think those were Michelle Trachtenberg's tits. You know, I understand the fantasy element, and I'm just you know, like, but like, <laughs> there really, there really is this like, 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 oh man, this is a really complicated topic, and I'm too drunk to get think, into it. Think like, of the, think else? of the time they could have spent actually going to some social interaction place and meeting a girl and actually getting her to show you her tits because she likes you. <laughs> think, think about all the like female celebrities who have like shown their tits. Yeah. Like, because they wanted to. There are uh, websites. There are thousands of websites that catalog them. You don't even have to pay for this. You can just go have it. And then to like want this particular actress that badly that you will like you go to that effort for it. Like is kind of astonishing. If, um, if the internet proves but, one thing, you know we're the ones talking about it. Yeah, so, you know. <laughs> but I mean, if the internet proves one thing, there is no limit to human depravity either. <laughs> it's just not only depravity, but just banality. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's this complete like, and I like if if your thing is like Michelle Trachtenberg and like like that scene in your trip and like wanting to see your tits and like that's your like interest, like you just have a, a thing for that. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not gonna judge that. We don't kink shame or I'm not gonna kink shame on this podcast, like or ever, you know, that's that's fine. But it also is sort of like a lot of this stuff doesn't feel like so much like I'm exploring a kink that I just legitimately have as much as it's um Michelle Trachtenberg has never shown her tits on screen, and I think that's horrible. And I just want to like take <laughs> that from her, that agency from her. So, yeah, we kind of get into that conversation. Yeah, again, it gets into this complicated sociological yeah. problem of like why people do this and, and psych- the psychology of it is kind of fascinating. But um, Eurotrip, fun movie. Gas Pump yep. Girls, also a fun movie. Yep. Uh, check them both out. I like Eurotrip better than Gas Pump Girls. Gas, uh, Gas Pump Girls, you know. Yeah, I you know. know. It's- it's kind of dumb. I mean, it's not. It's yeah. not like this, like brilliant film, but it's just so much like stupid, goofy fun. Oh yeah, and, uh, both, both movies are incredibly earnest in how dumb they are. And yeah, yeah. but uh, your trip is just a bit more sophisticated. That's the only difference. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Daniel, uh, tell people where they can find you on the internet. Absolutely. You can go find me. Uh, really, everything I do is at alwaysspaceman.com. I do a Doctor Who podcast with my wife. I do a Red Dwarf podcast with my wife. Um, as mentioned earlier, I just recorded a, an episode on the new Ghostbusters film, which I'm hopefully going to get up here in the next few days. Um, my wife's out of town, so I did that with a, another podcaster friend of mine. Um, just put up a thing about Stephen Moffat with a podcaster friend of mine. And um, I blog over to RootsRollInPress.com every week or so about um, whatever's on my mind, usually something involving sex and gender. So go check that out as well. Right on. And, of course, you can go to tmbdos.podbean.com to find all of our links to iTunes, Facebook, YouTube, all the good places. And, of course, again, our Facebook group is the best place to get in contact with us. Uh, they must be destroyed on site on Facebook, where we will uh, answer all questions, comments, suggestions on the air. We enjoy the interactions when we do get it. And uh, so, please, uh, and... Don't feel timid. Uh, If you have something to say, say it, and uh, we will uh, talk back to you guys because that's part of the fun of this whole thing. So yeah, I know we have some friends who really hate your trip. So like, please message below. We'll we'll respond. It's great. Yeah, yeah. There, there was at least one who said, "I hate this movie." (laughs) So, so listen to this episode. Let us know what you think and respond, and we'll read it next week. It'll be great. Yeah, it'll be fun. And uh, next week is going to be the final episode of this portion of our sex comedy series before we transition into Spaghetti Westerns, and it is going to be the Meatballs series. More specifically, part three and part four, but we will talk about one and two as well, and that should be quite interesting. Part three and four are proper sex comedies. Part one is not at all, and part two was supposed to be, but then wasn't. So, yeah. uh, well, but uh, we will be, I guess, I don't know if we're going to be discussing all four, but we're going to talk about meatballs next week. It's gonna yeah. Be meatballs as a whole. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll get into some of that. And uh, yeah, yeah. that should be a good cap. <laughs> really the lesson is I have to watch all four of them, but I don't necessarily have to plot summarize all four. Of them, no, so, yeah. no, that's, that's good. You, you, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll cut you some slack. You don't have to plot summarize the first two at the very least. Yeah. So, 
<laughs> we'll just do three and four. And four is basically like you know that episode of South Park where they're uh, where they're trying to save the ski school. It's mm-hmm. that, but on water skis, and it has Corey Feldman. So yeah. yeah, well, yeah, it's Hot Dog the movie with water skis. Is this yeah, what yeah, it is? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, so uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for joining me. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we will see you guys again soon. Bye bye. Very soon. Bye. Feliz
Thank you for listening to They Must Be Destroyed on Sight. For past episodes, links to the host's other stuff, and links to podcasts and websites of similar interest, please visit us at tmbdos.podbean.com. There you can also find links to us at iTunes and YouTube, as well as our Facebook group link, which is the best way to get in touch with us. We welcome all comments, questions, movie review suggestions, and criticisms, and we do our best to respond to everyone. You can also find us at Daniel's recently launched oispaceman.com, where you can find his sci-fi theme podcasts about Doctor Who and Red Dwarf. Thank you. Drive through.